This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. If you like us, please join our community of supporters by giving to our Patreon campaign. You'll find all about it on our homepage. Please consider giving. The Tel Aviv Review depends on your support. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern, and my guest today is a professor of Middle East Studies at Tel Aviv University. He is the author of The Sheikh of Sheikhs, Mithgal Al-Faiz and Tribal Leadership in Modern Jordan. It was published recently in English by Stanford University Press. Professor Yuav Alon, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello. So, Mithgal Al-Faiz, is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah, yeah there are several ways you can... The, the way he pronounces his own name is Mithgal. Mithgal, okay. That's the Bedouin way. Who was he and why does he deserve a biography? Well, Mithgal was uh, one of the greatest sheikhs of Arabia in the 20th century. He was the leader of a big tribal confederacy which lived in the areas that uh, now are Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. He was a very influential leader who rose to power in the late 19th century, early 20th century, played a very important role in the First World War, in the Transjordanian uh, theater of war, as an ally of the Ottoman Empire, by the way. Then he played a very important role in the establishment of Jordan in the 1921 under the auspices of the British Empire. And then he led his tribal confederacy for nearly 50 years until he died in 1967. Even today, we can see his legacy in Jordan, his uh, descendants. They play a prominent role in Jordan politics even till this day. Uh, for instance, his grandson is now the president of the Senate, the upper house. So when you thought about writing this book, Was it because there was virtually no one else more important in the formation of modern Jordan other than perhaps some kings or, you know, members of the royal family? And there were several things why I decided to write about him. First of all, there is nearly nothing written about tribal leaders in the Middle East. And those people were really, really important uh, figures and they played a very important role for centuries. In many ways, they still do today. So I want to uh, fill that lacuna. And also Mithkal attracted me because I stumbled on him in the archives, in the Central Zionist archives in Jerusalem, in the very early stage of my academic career. He had a very interesting relationship with a Jewish agency in Palestine in the 30s and 40s. We'll get to that in a I'm minute. I'm sure we will. <laughs> yeah. I realized that there's a lot of historical material about him. Usually the problem with writing about tribal leaders of his stature is that they did not read and write, so they didn't leave any historical record. But he was someone who, perhaps because he was so influential and powerful, he attracted many writings, and there's a lot of historical records about him written by British officials, Zionist officials, Americans and many explorers who uh, visited his camps. How did he rise to prominence? Was he just the right man at the right time in the right place? No. First of all, he was born to the right family. He was born to a family of sheikhs. His grandfather and father... When you say a confederacy of tribes, is it like the biggest one in Jordan or in the area? How, you know, what is their weight politically? Yeah, uh, well, uh, when he started his own career, it was one of the most powerful tribal confederacy in the Syrian desert. It had something like 8,000 people, 4,000 warriors. Today, they number something like 150,000 people in Jordan. A tribal confederacy is a political alliance between several tribal units. Tribal units, organizations, where the members assume they have blood relations. Uh, the tribal confederacy is usually more like a political alliance, but then they add to it some kind of a, a genealogy that uh, allows them to think about themselves as one family. Today, it's the third largest tribal confederacy in Jordan. And at the time? Uh, there was no Jordan, but it was uh, certainly in terms of its power, it was one of the most fearful tribal confederacy in the Syrian desert. Mm -hmm. So that you know, opened doors for him even before he started? Yeah, so he was born in the right family. He was born to what we call a shakely family. So he had uh, a very good starting point, but he had many brothers and cousins. So there was actually a tough competition on, on that position. And partly he managed to become a sheikh because he was so, he was wise. 
He was very courageous. He was a famous leader of raids. And also the, the context or the circumstances played to his hands. He was to power at the time of the First World War. Tribal leaders or tribal leaders with uh, military experience were in need and he knew how to take advantage of that situation. As you said, uh, first in the service of the Ottomans and then shortly afterwards he basically switched sides and formed this formidable alliance with the, with the Hashemites. How, di how did that take place. What can you tell us about the beginning of his relationship with the Hashemites? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that uh, characterized his uh, political strategy throughout his, his life. He didn't hesitate uh, to change allies and patrons when it suited him and his tribes. During the First World War, during the Arab revolt that was part of the war, the Hashemite wooed him and tried to uh, move him to their sides. But he became, he remained a loyal Ottoman supporter until the very end of the war. Actually, he was the only person in what then became Jordan who could boost the title of Pasha, the highest rank in the Ottoman Empire. And he was very proud of it throughout his life. But uh, when the Ottoman Empire was dismembered following the war and the Ottoman troops withdrew from Jordan and from Palestine, from the entire area, he had to uh, recalculate his moves and he had a chance to uh, cultivate the support of King Faisal, the leader of the Arab revolt and for a short time the, the, the king of Syria before he became the king of Iraq and uh, Faisal uh, gave clemency to all the tribal leaders who fought against him during the war and Mithkal became one of his loyal supporters and when uh, Abdallah the second son of the leader of the Arab revolt Sharif Hossein maybe we maybe we using too many names here <laughs> <laughs> but, Faisal, but, but the founding uh, Faisal, king Faisal's of the elder, of Jordan, elder of brother came to Jordan in 1920 Mithkal was one of the first supporters. He invited him to come to Amman and rule a country from there. He promised to protect him and support him. And in many ways, he helped Abdallah to establish roots in the country and to persuade the British that they have to recognize his power there. There's a fine line between political astuteness and opportunism. Where would you categorize him in, the, in this very specific context of switching sides so effortlessly? Yeah, it's an important point because usually portrayals of tribal leaders in the Middle East emphasize the fact that they were greedy, fickle, untrustworthy. They lacked any ideology. And I dispute that description. I think he was an astute political leader. He had a strategy, a clear strategy. Tribal leaders switched sides all the times. And they did have an ideology, and the ideology was not Arab nationalism or um, religious ideology. It was the benefits of their own tribal leaders. They had to prove to their leaders, that they, to their constituency, that they were the best people to lead the tribes, and therefore they had to always think about the, ben the, the interest of their tribal members. The kings, Hossein and later Abdullah, trust him or was it just a marriage of convenience because he was so powerful so they you know they would prefer to have it on their side i think that between him and king abdallah the first the founder of jordan i think there was a some kind of a friendship but it was of course also a political friendship and each party knew the interests of the other i think they respected each other maybe they feared each other They cooperated with each other. Sometimes they fell out with each other. But I do think that they had some kind of a, a deep friendship. King Hussein, when King Hussein came to power in the 50s, Mithkal was uh, the twilight of his life. He was an elderly man. He was in his 80s, already uh, frail and ill. But I think the king probably uh, trusted him or respected him. And I think Mithkal uh, probably liked him also because he was so young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And his relationship with the British, who were, at the end of the day, calling the shots in the area in throughout the 20s, 30s and 40s, I mean, three, three, three and a half decades at least, was it similar, as um, pragmatic as it was earlier on with the Ottomans? Of course he was pragmatic. He had to be pragmatic, but he was also a very tough nut to crack. And he was a rival of the British. In many ways, his opposition to the first British attempt to rule the country in, the, in 1920, even before Abdallah came, played a very important role in the establishment of modern Jordan. The British were frustrated. They tried to make him an, an ally or 
get his cooperation and they failed. And when Abdallah came, he supported Abdallah and created a greater position to the British. Even afterwards, in the 20s and 30s, because he was so powerful, because he could master the support of his tribes, because he enjoyed the support of Abdallah, the British uh, disliked him. I think they liked him more when he was weaker in the late 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. But he knew... How, how did he become weaker? He became weaker because the tribal society became weaker, especially in nomadic society. Between the two world wars, nomadic society went through a, an economic crisis. The Bedouin, the pastoral economy, was no, more, no longer vital or vivid. The, during the late 20s and early 30s, Jordan went through an economic crisis, severe years of drought, uh, locust attacks, and the Bedouins were especially hurt and needed the help of the government. And then Mithkal needed the goodwill of the government, Abdallah and the British, and therefore he became weaker. Mm -hmm. But he could already master it because he had established good relations with the Hashemites and to an extent with the British. Yeah, and the British knew that also, although he was weaker, he was still strong. And they, didn't, they wanted to cultivate his loyalty or his support or his collaboration. Did they know in real time or did they think that they owe their power to his support? I mean, to what extent was he really instrumental in guaranteeing the longevity of the Hashemite rule? And to what extent do you think that he was as a researcher looking at it in retrospect? It is my assessment that he was really instrumental, especially in the first decade of the establishment of modern Jordan or the, what was called then the Emirate of Transjordan. I think without him, it seems really difficult to, to see Abdallah's managing that project. During the first few years, Mithkal was in many ways his chief of staff. He didn't have, the king did not have an army or the army was dysfunctional. And Mithkal's people defended the capital, Amman, against, especially against uh, Saudi encroachers. Mithkal gave Abdallah a local base of support. And I think he was really important in that regard. And also, as I mentioned, he was important in the opposition to the British. The British didn't want Abdallah, mm -hmm. but they realized that he had too many strong allies in the countries, first and foremost Mithkal, and therefore had to accept the reality. Would you say that he really shaped Jordan in his image, or would that be an exaggeration? That would probably be an exaggeration. <laughs> but he was really instrumental in the establishment of Jordan and its emergence. And again, I think putting the focus on him corrects the image of Jordan as only a Hashemite entity. Mm -hmm. There was a society there before the Hashemite came, and Mithkal is a good representative of that. Mm -hmm. Society. All right, and now for the moment we've all been waiting for his relationship to, to the Zionist leadership. That also in this arena, his nuance as a politician and his shrewdness really comes into play. Yes, completely. He was uh, one of the first uh, local leaders to identify the Zionist interest in Transjordan in, uh, in 1930 already. I want to remember that in, in Zionist ideology, both banks of Jordan formed the, the land of Israel, or the, the promised land, or the land that was supposed to be promised by the Balfour Declaration. So the, from, in the Zionist imagination, Palestine had two banks. And, and the kingdom of Jordan, Transjordan, was for the Zionists part of their national home. Yeah, and in 1922, when the British excluded the eastern part of Palestine from the Balfour Declaration, it was a big blow to the Zionist project. In the late 20s and early 30s, the Zionists tried to revive that option, also trying to take advantage of the crisis, the economic crisis in Jordan. Palestine was then prospering mainly thanks to the immigration from Central Europe following the rise of Nazism. It seems that there is a lot of capital in Palestine. And the people in Jordan looked at the Palestine and with, quite an, with jealousy and envy. And they thought that might, that might be an opportunity. And the, when the Zionists started to uh, send delegation of uh, surveyors and engineers and uh, mediators, Bithkal uh, understood that that might be a, an opportunity for him. And he seized it. And he cultivated Jewish uh, friendship and uh, political alliance for the next uh, with five like years. Whom? The most senior people. He he had close uh, connections with uh, Chaim Arlozov, then the head of the political department of the Jewish agency. He met uh, several times Chaim Weizmann, 
Nachum Sokolov, who replaced uh, Weitman as the leader of the Zionist organi- organization. Then after the assassination of Alozov, he met uh, many times with uh, Moshe Sharet, and he knew them all. And he was coming and going in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Zionist officials uh, visited him in Amman or in his camp somewhere in the desert. And they talked business. Mm-hmm. This too was a, a very instrumental alliance. It was really nothing more than that. Completely. There was no ideology in that alliance. Uh, he, Again, we tend to uh, project uh, the, the current situation or our current reality uh, to the past. But in the 30s, there was no nationalism in Jordan. There was no conditions for the spread of nationalism. So dealing with the Jews for Mithkal was like dealing with any other force in the region. They were a business partner. Partners, and that's it. He, he didn't see Palestine or the west of the Jordan River as part of his uh, sphere of influence. No, he was always, and his tribals, and his tribes were always their tribal territory was always in the east. They did have sometimes they encroached upon uh, some of they you could find the herds herding in the Jezreel Valley or in Gaza, but mainly they were in the area which is today Amman and east southeast of Amman. Maybe some of your listeners know Amman International Airport. Amman International Airport was built on the land of Mithkal mm-hmm. in the 70s. Right. And making his family even more rich. <laughs> <laughs> what was his perspective on Palestinians, I mean the Arabs, to the west of the, uh, the Jordan River? Again, he was looking for a patron, uh, like most tribal leaders did. And at some point, he and actually the first people he approached were the Palestinians. He was the largest landowner in Jordan. Jordan. He owns 70,000 dunams, which is, I think, 17,000 17, acres. But the land was mostly uncultivated because of the years of drought and the economic crisis. And he wanted to sell or lease the land to someone, anyone. And he first approached the Palestinians and he came back empty-handed. And then he saw an opportunity with the Zionists. And therefore, he offered them that project. Mm-hmm. You said in the beginning of this conversation that it was uh, his cons- con- tribal confederacy and he personally were among the the most powerful tribal leaders in the Middle East. Would you say, I mean, it's really interesting to look at, at Jordan's history and, you know, it is seen for a very good reason as one of the weaker countries in this area, both politically, economically, I mean, demographically, it's very problematic, yet it is to the best of my knowledge, one of the only Middle Eastern countries that never underwent a major revolution or civil war, any kind of strife that would endanger its political system. Would you say that people like Mithgal and maybe he himself laid the foundation, put in the infrastructure that allowed for the longevity of the Jordanian political system? Yeah, I think you hit it by the nail. That's exactly the paradox of Jordan. On the one hand, it seems to be weak and dependent on foreign support and foreign allies. On the other hand, one of the most stable countries in the Middle East, and especially when we look at the Middle East today, since uh, in the last decade or so. I think that to a large extent, the alliance between the Hashemite family and people like Mithkal, namely the heads of the tribes and the tribes themselves, explain why... Jordan is so stable. I think the Hashemite, through that alliance, meant to uh, create a large base of support for the regime and for the country. The tribes see in Jordan their homeland. They see the existence of Jordan as their prime interest, and they defend it. And each time Jordan faced a crisis, and he did, of course, like every other country, they came in his support. Uh, and I think that uh, explains why Jordan is so stable and why the Hashemite regime is perhaps one of the only, actually the only regime that survived the last century in the Middle East among the regimes that were created under colonial rule. So it did shape Jordan in his image. I, I, yes. I allow myself to exaggerate again. No, 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 no. I, yeah. I, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I think we can clearly distinguish or identify Mithkal's legacy in today's Jordan. Mm-hmm. And, and the role that his family still plays today uh, testifies to that. Mm-hmm. Because we are, we'll be running out of time shortly, I'd like to ask you another interesting question that isn't about Mithgal himself, but about you as a researcher. And you're an Israeli coming from an Israeli university, and part of, of your methodology was also interviewing people in his family, in his tribe. I mean, having personal access, not just, you know, not just archival work. 
How difficult was it? <laughs> I don't think it was difficult, but it took some time. I had an advantage at the early stage of my research that I came from a British university. So it, it made things a bit easier. And actually, and also when I started my research in Jordan, it was a different period. It was the late 90s. And then the years of the peace process, everybody, especially in Jordan, were, were, was very hopeful and optimistic. Actually, I was more pessimistic than they mm-hmm. did, but I enjoyed a window of opportunity. And when I first came to Jordan, I found lots of goodwill and people were curious to meet an Israeli. Sometimes I felt that I was in a zoo. People <laughs> were really, really curious and wanted to see who is this Israeli guy who worked there. And in Jordan, if you have the right connection, you can get to nearly everyone. And I happened to meet a Jordanian scholar who knew one of Mithikal's sons. So I was granted an interview. It was very short, and then he, uh, he told me that we should continue that at his home over dinner. Unfortunately, uh, two, three weeks later, he died. Oh. So I lost the contact to the family. But then I managed to resume it. By that time, the family had already read some of my writings, I was invited to meet them. They kind of questioned me. But they, I think they understood that I was a bona fide researcher, that I really took interest in the founding father. And they wanted, I think, to give their own perspective. Yeah, because it's interesting. It's not just because you're Israeli. I mean, any country, when, when there's someone coming from the outside to write about one of the national heroes, they treat him with suspicion, regardless of the Israeli-Arab conflict. Do you feel that this was more like what impeded you from getting access to them or what necessitated the time that it took, uh, more than, you know, you being an Israeli? Yeah, most researchers, Western researchers, when they come to Jordan and probably other countries, the assumption is that somebody th- sent them. Always, oftentimes I was asked, who sent me? Who paid for me? And of course I said, you know, my university, but nobody took any notice. I'm sure they, were sh- I'm sure they thought that I was sent by some kind of an intelligence agency. Mm-hmm. I think with the family, they realized that I was really a, an academic. I was already established academic by that time. They knew where I was. They saw my writings and they accepted me. And I think they were flattered by the fact that I'm interested in their own history. And they also realized that I know about the father or grandfather so much more than they did. Yeah. And so I think they really took interest in, in my project. Mm-hmm. And what about working in Arab archives? I mean, is it really different from working in archives uh, in the West? Uh, no, I don't think so. The, the only thing is that the access is more limited. Uh, you don't have in Jordan the likings of the British National Archives or the American National Archives or, or, or even the Israeli, Israeli ones. Most of the political material is kept in the palace. Very few people can see it. I did work in the National Archives and I actually benefited from a lot of their materials. But of course, I didn't see everything. Mm-hmm. Do they have like a sense of history? I mean, of oh, yeah. national history? Yeah, like, yeah. Very much so. Mm-hmm. Very much so. And, and there are many committed Jordanians who uh, uh, try to preserve history, especially oral history. Oral history is a big thing in Jordan now, and it's really important, I think. Yeah, because there's really uh, very little alternative, because they, m- many of them, as you said, were illiterate and didn't leave exactly. a lot of them. Yeah. Exactly. Why do you think, though, until Yoav Alon, this uh, young Israeli researcher, came along, nobody thought about writing a momentous book about Mithgal? First of all, uh, not many historians wrote about tribes or tribalism, not to mention sheikhs. I was fortunate to uh, be educated at Tel Aviv University with a great professor, the late Professor Kostiner, who uh, opened for me this world of tribalism in the Middle East. Political science, sociologists, historians tend to think that tribalism was a dying phenomenon, that the modern era would erase tribalism, that the state would be a replacement for the tribe. And therefore, it was not an important uh, theme for inquiry for many, many years. Professor Kostiner, and I was convinced, knew or realized that tribalism is an important phenomenon that actually characterizes the Middle East until this very day. And we should study it. And I think that's my, one of my contributions in, this, in that book. So uh, this book is uh, dedicated to Professor Kostiner's legacy uh, almost as much as it is to Mythgal's legacy. Of course. Absolutely. All right, Professor Yoav a uh, Middle East scholar at uh, Tel Aviv University, the author of The Sheikh of Sheikhs, Mythgal al Faiz and Tribal Leadership in Modern Jordan. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.
And also big thanks to Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, to Itai Shalom, our producer, and to the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. Dali Shenlin, my trusted co-host, will be back with us shortly. And now we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we would like to ask you this. Please consider writing us a review. Just launch the app, select our podcast in the library section, scroll down to ratings and reviews, and press write a review, and then, of course, write one. You too can support us by going to our website, that's tlv1.fm slash review and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. We've got gifts and perks and other things for you. Check out our archive with almost 500 interviews. If you like what we do here, you can also like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast, Ideas from Israel. And follow me and Dali on Twitter. And of course, join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye.